welcome to this video. My name is Jay Wakefield. Now recently I've done quite a few videos on both Dell's <coughs> and uh, the last couple of computers I've had a look at uh, on video have been Pentiums. Well, both of them have been Pentium 133s actually. So I thought we'd take a break from the norm and do something that wasn't a Pentium or a Dell. Even though one of the Pentiums that I looked at was a Compaq, but never mind. Now, <coughs> this is a laptop, well, I'm guessing anyway, but this is a, 20, a T2130CS. Now, I'm not sure if it says it anywhere on here. Oh, there it does. It says it in embossed lettering that this machine is not a Dell or a Compaq, but is actually a Toshiba. Now, <coughs> I did make reference to this machine in one of my first VSF videos, the Toshiba 430 CDT as this machine is a lot like the 430 CDT. However, unfortunately, I mean, that reference was relevant at the time because that original video was originally aired on my old channel, Blue Planet 64. When Blue Planet 64 was closed, I literally just kind of took off the Blue Planet 64 ident and stuck some video from Frontier ones on it. And on Blue Planet 64, I'd actually had a look at this laptop. Now, <clears throat> due to illness, I've not really been able to actually do anything since with this machine. So it is pretty much in the same condition it was in when I looked at it on the Blue Planet 64 channel. Which is actually, well, quite shocking really, because that means I've left it a couple of months and I've not done anything with the machine. Lucky, luckily though, there is an upside to that. Basically, I can do the review of this machine all over again. And plus, I woke up quite early this morning and I was chatting to my friend Matthew on Google Chat or Talk or whatever, G Talk, I think it is. And, um, you know, I, I actually said to him that, you know, about six o'clock that, um, you know, I'm going to call it a night as far as sleeping was concerned and I was probably going to get up and do a video on a 486 laptop and that's just what I'm doing here. Well the 486 processor um, that originally appeared in 1989 uh, which was perfect because we were still all using 286s and well, pretty much only the creme de la creme of society could afford 386s. Um, then again that was always the way with computers. I mean, the 486 appeared onto the scene and people started adopting them as the Pentium came out. And, well, I'm going to be honest. The processor the 486 has had, well, it has had quite a cult following. Originally produced, well, Intel produced them in speeds from 20, well, th I can't even mind whether they did it in a 25 megahertz form or not. Actually, yes, they did. The, let me think, yeah. The dead. The dead, I believe, probably 16 to all the way up to 100 megahertz. AMD did an AM46 486 right up to 133 megahertz. And my friend from Kentucky, who is going to be sorting Billy Cord out with a Dell Latitude CPI, he has a compact with a 486 that goes up to. Get this, 180 megahertz. I've got Pentium chips slower than that. That is just amazing. It's just, you know. So, I mean, the 486, it wasn't a slouch or anything. And it was brilliant because with the turbo button that was available on most PCs, which can downplay a computer, a central processing unit's clock speed, the 486... It could be slowed down enough to play older games like Test Drive 3 and yet it still had enough muscle at normal speeds to be able to play games like Wolfenstein, Doom or anything like that. 
So really, it is a cult processor. Now this is a Ford AT6. They did a few flavours. They did the SX, which was basically cheap end. Um, basically, you know, if you're in the market for a Ford AT6 today, avoid the SXs if possible. They're just basically worthless. Um, although if, if you really absolutely must have an SX, go and get one. I, I get the feeling, though, that... Um, you know, if I was presented with the choice to own an SX or see it go to the tip out, I would probably actually take it. And I, I can't see computers being destroyed. Um, <coughs> the, dead, the DX, which was of course the fully blown version, the SX was... Um, well, the SX was quite funny, because the SX chips were basically... DX chips in which some of the features were intrinsically broken. So Intel would mark them down as, as SXs. Um, the DX was of course the fully working for ATSXs, sexes And then there was DX2s, which were basically like DXs, except they had clock doublers on them. So while the front side bus, which basically communicates with all the things like uh, you know, processor to the RAM and the ION, etc, etc. That would be at the processor's regular speed, yet the processor itself would operate at double the speed. So if it was a 33 megahertz front side bus, the processor would operate at 66 megahertz. If it was a 20, 25 megahertz FSB, it would offer, operate at 50. Now this was a DX4. Now DX4s, you might think, are actually clock quadrupled. No. Intel could not get rights to use the, the DX3 name. Seems a bit odd. So, in a, in a move that confuses a lot of people, they called these the DX4s. Now, these really were the creme de la creme of 486s. And, officially, they were never actually called 486s, even though, let's be honest, they still were. So this is this has got a 25 megahertz front side bus, clock tripled, which basically means it's a 75 megahertz machine. I would like to get a DX4 100. Um, unfortunately, it's just well, it just doesn't seem to be any going around. I have a couple of DX. Well, I've got uh, I've got uh, three other 486 laptops. I've got a 433C compact Contura Aero which runs at 33 megahertz. I've got a Acer, Acer Note 760C, which runs at 66 megahertz, and I've got a Dell Latitude CP, uh, XP, which runs at 75 megahertz. Okay, enough, enough of my jabber jabber. Let's actually have a look at this machine. And it's Cult Classic 486 processor. Okay, well, on the left side we have a Kensington lock slot which is actually on the body of the machine rather than on the hard disk caddy, as was the case with the Dell Latitude XPI. And a power button, which is always useful. And we have a PC card slot. Now this must have been designed for PC card slots that have cables coming out of them. So this PC card door, it'll open once. Open twice, or three times. I was becoming awfully worried there. And I'm guessing what you do is you pop the PC card in, like so, and then you can open it and you, you can see that there's access to the port on the network card or if it doesn't work like that you can open the bigger door so I'm guessing this is quite good because it means you don't necessarily have to take your PC cards out of the machine which is kind of nice, and it keeps them all nice and protected. I'm going to obviously remove this one because it's not 
wasn't ever installed within Windows and it would probably it would probably get me into trouble. So I'm just gonna move this one over here. And <clears throat> if we have a look on the front now, we see that there's really nothing on here. There's a couple of what look like lights, I'm not entirely sure. Oh yeah, the battery and power indicators. Very nice. And then on the right hand side we have a floppy disk drive. One in a 1.44 meg. And then on the back we have PS2 mouse and keyboard port. RS-232 serial port. VGA out. Behind this kind of door thing there's the usual Toshiba docking station part. Then we have a, a just a regular clover leaf plug. And this is a good thing about these class this class of laptops. There was no power brick needed, which basically means if the plug went, you didn't have to buy a specific one. You know, I mean I could just plug this in now using a normal Clover leaf plug, which I'm going to do. Although I did actually neck this off of a compact power brick, but um, still. There we go. And I'm just going to plug it in down here. And yes. And yes, American friends, you can say all you want about how odd our plug sockets look. Yeah. At least all of ours are earthed. At least we don't have two different types of plug sockets. I mean, what's all that about? Um, heaven only knows. I mean, I know you guys have got two and three pin plugs. And, like, you know, if you wanted to plug in a monitor and all you could find were two pin sockets, it'd be a nightmare. Um, and then, of course, there's a... Um, IEEE 1284 parallel part. Okay. Machine. It's a wee bit smaller and yet a wee bit chunkier than the T, well, the 430 CDT. Keyboard's quite nice and it has the usual track point mouse, which was um, common on Toshiba's of the day. And I believe this is a speaker here. Hang on, I'm not sure. Does this have sound or not? Actually, no, I don't think it does. Um, do you know what? No, this doesn't actually have a sound card in it. Now, this machine was actually designed for Windows 95. Which is actually <coughs> probably more common than I would have originally thought because it's it's not often that you get 486s which are designed for Windows 95 and a lot of people will tell you, well certainly in an issue of PC Guide dated 1998 a lot of people would say that if you want if you're, if you're on, in the market for a 486 laptop go for Windows 3.1 which is odd because this one actually came preloaded with Windows 95 on it. So let's have a look. Okay, just like the T. Well, just like the 430 CDT. Uh, most Toshiba, you, you know, you've got to really mean it when you press the on button. Another thing that um, sets this apart from my other 486 laptops. Okay, it's uh, obviously no battery on here. So um, let's have a look. It's got 24 megs of RAM. Um, <coughs> it can display 2,000, no, 256,000 colors. Well, actually, more like. Uh, 262,144 24 bit colour um, 
text mode stretch, yes, I like to have that enabled. Go for full power. And... Do you know what? That seems fine to me, so I'm just going to click the end key. Am I sure I want to save changes and exit? Yes, I am. So it's got 24 megs of RAM. And it's got a 500 megabyte hard disk. Which, if you ask me, is... Well, the RAM is enough for Windows 95. I would say it's most definitely enough to run Windows 95. However, on the hard disk front, I would say you'd need a gig to run Windows 95 comfortably. 500 megs on Windows 95, there's really not much you can do with it. Which is a shame, really. And the display is 640 by 480 pixels, VGA, which is kind of standard for the day. But what sets this apart from my other 486 laptops is this has got an active matrix display. Whereas all the others are passive. And because it's got that active matrix display and it's got a 486 processor, this would be more than ideal for DOS gaming. It would be nice if it had a sound card. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. You know, and as soon as I'm in the market, and as soon as I've got the cash and I can get one, I'll probably end up with a parallel part sound card anyway. So I must admit, I mean, <coughs> this laptop is, is shaping up to be quite a good one. Windows 95, it loads really quite quickly. Let's just have a look at what version we're looking at here. It's Windows 95B, so at least I've put on the right version. Registered to laptop computer. 80486 processor, 24.0 megs of RAM. Now, Windows 95 will run on anything as low as a 386. However, if I had a 386 computer... I certainly wouldn't be putting 95 on it. You know, it does take a painfully long amount of time to load. Let's have a look at some of the things on here. Talking of uh, things not to do with an older machine, Internet Explorer 4. That wasn't the best move in the world, now was it? Okay, maybe in 2001. If you really couldn't get IE5 on here, that IE4 would have sufficed. It was much better than IE3. But, um, no. Nowadays, I don't think so. Um, let's have a look at the hardware configuration. 640k base RAM 23744. Extended Shadow RAM 192. 576 kilobytes. Ugh. You know programs old when it's measuring stuff in kilobytes. Contrast that to now where me memory is measured in megabytes. Gigabytes. And let's have a look at the hard disk space. I'm going to go to properties. So, I mean, yeah, it does have some space on it. And I guess if I was a business user, I probably could use Windows 95 on here. Probably with Office for Windows 95. I mean, it doesn't really take a lot to run Windows 95. Not really. Personally, though, I might put 3.1 on this. Because, you know, I, I just... I get the feeling that it'll work really, really well with Windows 3.1 Plus. I actually have the drivers for that. So let's have a look at uh, the display properties. I locked at 640 by 480. That's nice. 
high color 16 bit can go 16, 256 or 16 bit or 24 bit and it does actually have a 1 meg video card which is um, something that um, for those of you who saw my video review of the Dell Latitude XPI will know that um, it only had a f well, it only had 896 kilobytes of uh, video memory, and that actually did affect it. I couldn't run, for example, the display at 800 by 600 with uh, full color. I had to run it with 256 colors, which um, I found odd given the rest of the machine's specs. But I mean, I really do like this machine. You know, I think it's absolutely fantastic. What I think I'm going to do is, um, well, I'm definitely going to format it. I know that much. I don't like to keep a user's data on a machine. I usually like to format it and put it with my own install of Windows. If I don't like 3.1 very much, you know, I can always push it back to 95 or something. <clears throat> or maybe try OS 2 or, you know, be a bit creative about the thing. But um, I do very much like this machine. You know, and I... Um, you know, I'm I'm definitely really quite glad I got it. So this has been me, Jay Wakefield, talking about a Toshiba laptop. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please subscribe. And instructions on how you can do so will follow. And it turns out this computer did not have a sound card. So thank you for watching. And I hope you'll see my next video.